Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Mike. I am the American analyst. And today, the big news, the United States out of Afghanistan. We are going to be talking about the United States current role, what the withdrawal from Afghanistan means, and also some thoughts and musings about the future. If you like what I do, please be sure to like this video, subscribe to my channel, and follow me on Twitter and Minds. Let's get into it. Okay, so jumping right into this one. After 18 years, is this Afghan peace or just a way out? Uh, I'm really not going to talk about this article. I just wanted to use this more as a springboard to talk about the current state of geopolitics and America's place in the world. I think that, though, I think the war in Afghanistan, I'm glad that we're out. However... It was necessary to go in, if nothing else than national prestige. Um, and before you think, who cares about that? It, it is actually really important how other countries see you. It is very important. So we, you, we had to show the world at the time that you cannot just attack the sovereign territory of the United States and get away with it, scot-free. We had to do that. Uh, it was necessary, and if we hadn't, like, like, could you imagine if they, if the Japanese had attacked Pearl Harbor, and we did nothing? That such a such a sign of weakness would would only encourage more aggression. So I think we did have to go in, but the the planning was bungled from the beginning. It just was. There's no other way to. There's no other way to put it. There's no strategic interests in this in this country that we have which is another reason why I'm fine with with us getting out because there's nothing there's nothing worth fighting over and there never has they make the comparison of the United States with the British Empire and the Soviets which uh, I don't think it's a perfect comparison but it is it's not perfect but it is valid in that Afghanistan is known as the the graveyard of empires that empires go there to die. And again, not a perfect comparison, but not not imperfect either. There's nothing of value in Afghanistan. There's nothing. So again, I'm, I'm fine with us getting out. But as I said, I, I wanted to use this as a springboard to talk about other things, uh, history in particular. So with that being said, this is a map of the world in 1914, just before the original cataclysm that was the First World War had uh, had begun. And as you can see here, the light pink is the British Empire, which dominated the globe at this particular point in history, but it had also peaked and was in a decline relative to its neighbors. Uh, the blue is the French Empire, which uh, just a poorer version of England. Um, and you see that you have some of the Ottomans in here. The big thing I wanted to focus on is the British, which again is the light pink. The Americans is the light blue. The Chinese right here. They, there was a country right here, Mongolia, <laughs> that for some reason this map had just included in China, whatever. But the main thing is I wanted you to see is the colonial empires just before this conflict. And this was, this was the height of, of Europe, I guess you could say. Um, and the next thing I wanted to show you, I mean, huge portions of this map are just absolutely dominated by the, by the European empires. Italy has a, as an empire. Portugal had an empire. Obviously, the Germans had an empire. Just everybody was getting in on the game. Here, though, is much more important. This is a GDP by country in 1860. Why am I showing you GDP by country in 1860? <laughs> well, uh, 1860 was very much the peak 
of British power. Now you might say to yourself, well, look at China. How much? Look how much bigger their GDP is than the United Kingdom in 1860. Well, it's not really, it's not really relevant because China is so much larger than Great Britain at this time, and and obviously even now, that almost all of their GDP was internal, was feeding themselves, for lack of a better word. Whereas in the United Kingdom, almost all of its GDP was exports. And also, you got to consider India was part of the British Empire at this point. So you can just go ahead and add that. <laughs> go ahead and add that total um, to the United Kingdom. But uh, India is also very similar. A lot of its economy was internal at this time. However, what I really wanted to point out is that the United Kingdom had the largest Western economy. And at this part, at this point in the in the world, only the West was really uh, industrialized to any in any significant way, and the United Kingdom had the largest industrialized economy. It is it is not possible to have a global conflict in 1860. Um, the United States, obviously, there was a local conflict, a brutal one, the Civil War, but. World War I, World War II was not possible in 1860 because Britain dominated the globe, which is what I wanted to point out as one of the misconceptions that it hasn't, it's not like, look, I, I love America as much as anybody else, probably more, <laughs> but it's not like it was 1776 up to now, it was nonstop dominating. <laughs> it wasn't like that at all. 1860 was very much an Anglo-centric world. So I wanted to point that out and that it was also, it was impossible to have this conflict when, when Britain bestrode the globe like a colossus. Here's 1913, prior to, as I said, the first cataclysm. You can see the U.S. is, is just, is dominating in terms of uh, economic might. Britain has been overtaken by Germany. And Russia has overtaken France. And China just has had virtually no growth. But I mean, in nineteen in World War One context, that's not they weren't that important in terms of World War One. Um, this this world, however, is ripe for conflict. You have the old established power, the United Kingdom, fading fast. Even though they still have their great empire, as you can see, even though they still have that. They're fading fast. And new challengers rise up. And it is only in it is only in this context that you can have a, a truly cataclysmic war, which which is like something that happened in the First World War. Which then brings me to this. This is a map of today. Today's whatever. This is a current map. <laughs> <laughs> so, this is a map of today uh, okay um this is a current map and you can see the the colonial empires are gone they've been swept away partially because of the cataclysm that happened in, during the first world war and if you ask me good riddance they they weren't very moral um entities but they weren't Im immoral empire is just empire it's a w way of governance and it's much more difficult to tell now you who's in who is in control who's in charge basically you see the russians still have a huge amount of territory but it's it's not like they were under the soviet union the main thing i wanted to show you was the contrast between the 1914 map and this one that all these empires have been swept away within a very short period of time 100 years is not that long of time in the grand scheme of of history and finally you have today this is well from 2018 and you have the Chinese have overtaken the United States in uh, world economy as you can see after 123 years China once again becomes the biggest economy in the world that's true that is 100% true there are several uh, metrics you could use um, like GDP per capita I think some really small country probably has the most GDP per capita. Um, nominal 
GDP is another one that the United States still has um, has a lead in that nominal GDP. But the point is that there's a challenge to the to the international order, and it is only through that that conflict can arise. Which brings me back to Afghanistan. I think we do need to go. I we do need to get out of Afghanistan. I think it's a very good. I think it's very a very good posture to have, and yet we have to be careful about isolationism. This could be something that is like, well, I mean, you know, we left Afghanistan and nothing bad really happened, so why don't we just leave everywhere? It's like, well, maybe you think, maybe you think that we should, and there's certainly arguments to be made that we should. I don't like spending random amounts of money in countries I've never heard of. But why I went through all that to get to this is that the world will not leave us alone. Because currently the the economic world order is centered around the United States. The the reserve currency of the world is the is the US dollar. So don't think that we can just leave and all these other countries will be content with letting that happen. That's just not going to happen. So I think we need to be careful about pulling back from our commitments too quickly. I think we should. And in fact, I think it's inevitable that these international commitments we have will slowly be drawn back. But if, if if we leave a vacuum in our wake, it will only come back to haunt us. I can promise you that. That is all I have for today. If you like what I do, please be sure to subscribe to my channel, like this video, and follow me on Twitter and Minds. Have a good evening. Thank you all for listening. This is Mike, the American Analyst. Follow me on Twitter, Minds, and subscribe to me on YouTube. And be sure to hit that bell notification. I'll be coming out with new videos every single day for your viewing enjoyment. Have a good one.